So yeah, um, I was asked to come and do a keynote here, and I was obviously quite uh, appreciative that I was I was asked to do such a thing. Um, I've not been to No Con Berlin before. I've been to the Goa edition quite a few times, and I've always enjoyed it. So it's nice to be here in Berlin in the beautiful weather that uh, <laughs> Germany's provided for us. But yeah, my keynote is basically uh, about security tooling and the types of things that I write to make uh, my life as a security researcher just that little bit easier. But I'd also want it to be sort of more keynote-y, less technical. So of course, it's sort of a call to action kind of presentation where I'm saying, you should do it too. And I think that I do actually believe that. I think I write my tooling and probably so should you if you do not already. So let's get on with the, uh, the presentation. So for the people who don't know me, I'm James. I'm a security researcher at Google Project Zero. Uh, Google Project Zero, if you don't know who they are, is a team at Google who looks primarily at third-party applications and tries to find security vulnerabilities, then gets them fixed by the vendor as quickly as possible under a 90-day de disclosure deadline. And obviously, everyone has their specialization in Project Zero, but my specialization is Windows. And as part of that, I write a lot of tooling. My history uh, in the industry is actually I started as a developer, and it was only later that I came into security. So I've got a lot of experience writing uh, computer software and building tools for, for various things. Now, obviously, from a tooling perspective, there's loads of different sort of variations of it. Because I'm... I primarily focus on finding logical vulnerabilities, which are obviously not your run-of-the-mill memory corruption. I don't tend to write fuzzers, for example. So you will not see me talking about how you write a fuzzing tool in this, but you can kind of assume that this is the kind of thing that you can also do. Like if you, if you, if these are the types of bugs you want to look for. Memory corruption, then fuzzing is also something you can do, but logical vulnerabilities are always more interesting there potentially harder to find and that's why I find tooling to be to be so important in my my research process now of course most people are using tools if you're a security researcher especially if you're using uh, doing research on say windows where you do not have much in the way of source code regardless of what may be on github at any moment in time um, you would probably have to use a tool such as Ida Pro or Gidra. If you went to the workshop yesterday, maybe you now know how to use Gidra. Um, and it's a tool, right? Um, of course, it allows you to disassemble existing binaries and try and find security vulnerabilities in them. Maybe you're having to do debugging. Maybe you're trying to debug an export you're trying to write. It's not, not working quite right. So you stick it in WinBag or WinDBG, depending on your, your preferences. And you can uh, debug your applications and, and your vulnerabilities in your exploits. Um, or you're writing code. So I actually have a habit of writing code in Notepad. And don't criticize me. Um, if Vim was installed by default, I would, I'd definitely be using that. But uh, it tends not to be on Windows. Um, but yeah, you're probably using an IDE, such as Visual Studio, VS Code, uh, Xcode, etc. Now, yes, all these are tools. But the key thing here is these aren't really security specialized tools. Like, yes, IDA Pro is kind of the closest, you could argue, to something which is um, very much security related. But of course, it's, it's really a general purpose tool for reverse engineering any binary. It doesn't matter if you're using it for finding security vulnerabilities. So when I'm talking about tooling here, what I'm talking about is domain-specific tooling, writing tooling which is uh, pre defined in, in the domain that you're looking for, the, the security research space, and usually specifically targeted at a specific particular area of, of your research process. Now, okay, when I say writing tools, of course, you may be thinking, well, I'm not going to write my own special customized version of IDA Pro because it'd take me forever, right? It takes... Hundreds of people, well, maybe not hundreds of people in Ida Pro's case, but like many, many hours of work to, to do even close to a, a tool of that, that size. So, of course, you don't have to start out writing the sort of great, great American novel of security tooling. You can just start small, start at the smallest rung and, and go from there. 
Um, so one area that obviously is really easy to get into just writing basic tooling is just sort of simple automation of common tasks you have to do during your research process. So if you're ever having to re research on Windows, you're almost certainly going to end up uh, encountering GUIDs or globally unique identifiers. These are 16-byte unique values, which are just used everywhere on Windows. Um, they, they're used to, to identify things. They'll be used in database uh, keys and all that sort of stuff. They're just everywhere because Microsoft never saw a, a problem which couldn't be solved with a GUID of some kind. Now, IDA Pro will kind of do a good job of like saying, okay, these are the parts of that GUID structure. It's technically not an opaque 16-byte value. It has some structure to it. But most of the time when you don't want to use that GUID, of, uh, you need to have it sort of in a string form. Uh, maybe you're trying to search on your favorite search engine and try, and try and find any uses of this GUID, especially if it's like just embedded in a binary somewhere. Maybe it's in the registry. And generally, you need this as a string. So you can do it. You can manually copy and paste out of IDA Pro and just go, right, here's my, here's my string. But of course, that's er potentially error prone. And it's a lot of work. And if you have to do this on a, on a semi-regular basis, it's best to try and automate it. So the beauty is IDA Pro has extensibility mechanisms, as does WinDebug and Visual Studio. And in IDA Pro's case, you have a, a Python integration. So you can actually write a relatively simple Python script to interact with the user. So you can query where the current cursor is in the, the memory space of that disassembled file read out 16 bytes of data from that from that database and just format it using the standard Python libraries as a GUID. Just print it to the console or do annotations of the uh, of the disassembly. And of course, what you get is a really quick, simple string. And you can take that string and you can plug it, put it wherever you like. And this really is not very much work, but it saves me, obviously, over time, if you're doing this a lot, it's going to save you time. And it is... While this is still not as domain specific as I'd like, it's obviously very important for my research to be able to make my my reverse engineering process much more streamlined and and realistic. So a common idiom you'll see when, especially when around sort of tooling and uh, development, is you obviously you work smarter, not harder. And I personally feel that that's wrong. Like right? realistically. The smartness should allow you to work harder. Like you shouldn't just like off, like give away your uh, stop hand to do any work because you've written this amazing tool. Okay, the fuzzers in the audience maybe go, "Well, no, that's exactly what I do, right?" Like I write my fuzzer and just let it go to work, and I can go and sit on a beach somewhere and earn money. Um, unfortunately for me, what my tooling ends up tending to do is just allowing me to be better at targeting the specific things that I need to actually spend time on. So obviously, in that case, wh what is the types of things that I try to do with my tooling to facilitate my ability to work harder? And one of them is just basic pattern matching. There's low uh, general security research is all about probably finding patterns of behavior and finding other places where that behavior also exists and using that to find your vulnerabilities. Like if you're trying to find cross-site scripting everywhere, of course, there's usually a, a relatively obvious set of conditions which are going to occur for that cross-site scripting vulnerability to be, to, be, to be evident. So, of course, there's usually patterns you can divine which allows you to identify uh, particular vulnerable pieces of code or particular places of interest to go researching. And so... One of my my basic tools of security research is just to find those patterns once I've identified them. So to give a very, very simple example, I'm not expecting you to really read this. This is just a placeholder to make it look pretty. Um, is uh, actually trying to, um, when I was doing work on .NET, a long, long time ago, I was doing research to .NET serialization attacks. Uh, this was the time where you could just run .NET in the browser. You could basically host, at one time you could just tell it to load a DLL and it would literally load a .NET DLL into Internet Explorer, which was amazing from, a, from an attacker's perspective. <laughs> um, but you also had XML browser applications and things like that, which were accessible from Internet Explorer and Firefox and gave you 
sandboxed nominally .NET code, but you could just run arbitrary .NET code in the browser. So I found that serialization was an interesting primitive to escape these sandboxes, and so I needed to find what classes were serializable and find sort of interesting behaviors on those classes. Because it wasn't just enough to find, oh, this class, this data class can be serialized from an object into a byte stream and then back from a byte stream to, a, to an object again. It actually has to do something interesting during deserialization, which allows you to attack it. And so I spent a bit of time doing the research and then I thought, okay, I need to find these classes. At the time, .NET didn't tend to have much in the way of, certainly for the base libraries, was not, um, the source code was not direct, generally available. So fortunately, .NET has reflection APIs. You can just enumerate all the types in a particular library and say, okay, is this a serializable type? That's one of the things you can do. But you can also say, okay, is this, does this implement this special interface, such as iSerializable, which I know through a bit of research that does something, executes code during the deserialization process. And so my tooling was literally pretty much this, just one function which went through a library, enumerated all the types, filtered out anything which wasn't serializable, and then said, does this have this interface? If yes, print it to the screen. If it has this interface, print it to the screen. And what this allowed me to do was narrow down from, say, tens of thousands of classes within the, the base class library of, of .NET and narrow it down to sort of in the low hundreds. And from there, I, could e I was able to either sort of improve my tooling just to sort of have a determine if there was anything particularly interesting or just literal manual analysis, running it in, again, at the time, reflect the sort of reflector, which is a, a .NET decompiler. Decompile the classes, have a look, see, does this do anything interesting? So really simple tooling. And again, like, you don't have to write an epic tool, like thousands and thousands of lines of code. It can be sort of of the order of, of 20 or 30 lines of code to find, to just automate away some of the... the the difficulty of writing, um, doing the security research process. But one of the things that, um, that work also demonstrated quite clearly is that you can use that as a sort of iterative cycle. So obviously I would run that tool, it would print out a load of classes, and I could then do the analysis of those classes and find if they have any interesting behavior. But it may be the case that during that analysis process, something else interesting came out. Like maybe this class implements an interface I never realized existed, and therefore maybe I should be looking for that as well. So you can, of course, feed that back into your tooling and run it again, find more targets, inspect more targets, and just keep going around the loop until you run out of things to do. So again, you don't need to... You can start small and just sort of build up from there and, and improve your tooling over time. And it doesn't have to be a one-shot thing where you write your tool and, and, and get it all over and done with. Um, so, uh, obviously, uh, Power, PowerPoint decided to uh, reformat this wrongly. There we go. <laughs> Again, the, 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 the uh, code itself is not that interesting. Um, but one of the things I found, this was about 10 years later, actually, like um, another time where I found I needed to do .NET serialization attacks, there was this, at this point, you couldn't just run arbitrary code anymore. Internet Explorer is mostly gone and Microsoft had blocked things like XML browser applications for a long, long time without a prompt, at least. So running arbitrary .NET code is no longer an option. Um, so I actually found some serialization attacks in, dot, in the .NET framework, and I needed some serializable class which would actually do something during the deserialization process which was directly exploitable. It was no longer possible to just maybe get these classes back and then I could manipulate them. I actually had to have it all run completely automated within the deserialization to be a useful attack. And I, I realized that um, there's obviously various classes that I knew to be serializable, which probably shouldn't be. One of them being in .NET, this delegate class. So a delegate class, you can think of it as like a function pointer. And it can be assigned to point to, say, process.start. And if you run that delegate, it would start a process, as, as the name might suggest. And it turns out, for some bizarre reason, I'm sure 
the original designers of .NET had a reason for this. That class is serializable. So, of course, if you can find a class which potentially has a serializable delegate inside it and does something interesting with that, maybe you could get that to deserialize and then get it to run this arbitrary function pointer effectively. Um, so that's what I did. I just modified my, my serialization code. I literally sort of dug out the code I wrote 10 years ago and just write, okay, let's add a new condition, this serializable delegate condition. Um, and I found one. I found a perfect class. I think this was actually introduced in .NET 4.5, which considering um, that's many, many years after the original .NET was introduced, and many, many years after serialization was considered a very bad thing and you shouldn't be serializing delegates at the very least, this new class was written, and no one ever seems to have cared. Like, it was, it's, this has never been fixed. Um, and it's a comparison class. It compares two objects together and returns, like, is it nominally above or below or equal? Um, and it has inside a serializable delegate, which we can point to process.start. So I was able to use that. You can embed it inside um, a hash table, which is like a dictionary. And during the deserialization process of the hash table, it would actually run this comparer to try and rebuild its key state. And so you could just uh, get it to run arbitrary code during the deserialization process. And if you want, you can go on the Project Zero blog. If you search for exploit.net manage decom, you'll find uh, my whole write-up about this and the process I went through to try and find these serializable classes. And it's, it's kind of interesting. So again, it's kind of I needed I, that tooling was what allowed me to find those research targets to actually see if I could exploit them. Now, another so that's to a degree sort of automating away some of the drudgery of, of the research process. Now, another thing I, I write tooling for is to allow me to do manual analysis of, of attack surfaces and, and UI or API surfaces primarily. So obviously there's a there's an impedance mismatch between humans and Win32 API calls uh, that you need some sort of bridge in between, like a computer program to bridge that that gap. And that's one of the sets of tools I write. I write a tool to bridge the gap between those two domains. And it allows me to play with things. I can just go, oh, wonder what would happen if I sent this this parameter to this function? Does it do anything interesting? And I can sit there and type away on my computer and uh, try and find security vulnerabilities that way. Um, so the thing I come back to when it comes to like sort of complex systems which really benefit from having sort of tooling to, to improve a sort of analysis, at, the manual analysis and inspection of it, is COM. So this is my simplified diagram of COM activation. Um, obviously, the fact that it's extremely complicated. This is, trust me, the simplified version of this diagram. And COM has loads of places. So you have, a, say, a user process which wants to create a COM object. It has to go to the registry and goes, oh, okay, is this COM object exists? Is it registered anywhere? Yes, it is. Okay. Well, actually, it's out of process. It runs not in a DLL, but in an executable. Oh, okay. I need to talk to a system service who knows about this. The system service then goes back to the registry and has to do access checking and pull more data out of the registry, which creates a new executable, which also does some weird stuff and looks to the registry and all manner of crazy stuff just to run an executable and connect to it. It seems a bit absurd, but that's what it, what it's designed to do. And the trouble is inspecting a lot of this is, is quite difficult. Windows does not generally provide much in the way of tooling itself to give you an idea of what's going on when a COM object is activated and what that COM object actually does. The registry is all sort of disparate areas which have to be correlated against each other. So like um, app IDs, which reflect like sort of like a, a set of classes isn't like directly correlated because there's no sort of direct link. You have to sort of manually take the GUID of the app ID and try and match that to the class ID and all that sort of stuff. It's, it's a bit of a nightmare. So, of course, I write tooling for this sort of thing. So the tool I came up with in this case was uh, OLAView.net. If you ever use the SDK tool OLAView, um, it's similar. I stole the name, basically, and stuck .NET on the end in the, the 
good tradition of writing .NET tooling. And what this allowed me to do was enumerate all the sort of registry artifacts and, and file artifacts for COM, uh, store that in a database where you've all got a nice object model and everything links to each other and you can sort of go between app IDs and class IDs and interfaces. You can create new uh, instances of COM objects. You can say, what interfaces does this object support? Uh, from that interface, you can even go, what sort of functions does this support? What parameters does it take? And you can sort of play around and, and try and find interesting vulnerabilities using that, that tool. Um, so to give an example of the types of uh, vulnerabilities that I found using this sort of tooling, um, Windows has this concept of user sessions where you have um, you can have multiple users logged onto the same machine at the same time with different desktops. And in order to keep them separate, Windows creates you a new session, uh, which is just usually referred using a number of some kind, like just an incrementing number. And that is in theory isolated between users. So uh, a normal user can't access some other user on the same machine because that would be a security vulnerability if that was possible. Uh, unless you're an administrator, of course. If you're an administrator, all bets are off with, with regarding these sort of things. But of course, Microsoft don't tend to like to fix bugs which require you to be an administrator. They generally don't consider them security vulnerabilities. However, it turns out COM itself has this mechanism using this session moniker to instantiate COM objects on different desktops. And the interesting thing about this is it doesn't require you to be an admin to do so. That doesn't sound quite right. That sounds like a, a misfeature of some kind. However, fortunately, or maybe the reason they have never really fixed it, there are some preconditions to what COM object you can create. So a COM object has to uh, run out of process. Obviously, it has to not run in, in a DLL in, in the current process because that's kind of hard to achieve otherwise. It also has to be accessible. So there's like a set of security uh, requirements associated with that which say, can this user access this, this object or not? But of course, it's, it's possible to find classes which do meet these criteria. The trouble is, there's no inbuilt tooling to find those classes. And it'd be, it'd be interesting to know if even Microsoft have such tooling to, to do this sort of analysis. So my tooling was able to actually just go through the list of cl registered classes and say, okay, does this meet the criteria which would allow me to ex to exploit this cross-session? Once I'd found the list of classes which pot were potential targets, I was then able to do the analysis. I could create instances of them, see what interfaces they support, because it wasn't just enough that I could create the COM object. I also had to have, say, a function on it which did something useful. And it turns out I found like a perfect one. It allowed me to do it cross-session, this, this COM object could be created cross-session from a normal user. And crucially, it had a function on it, which was basically create process, just spawn a new process for me. Awesome. So all you do, create it cross-session, uh, obviously hoping that the domain administrator is logged onto your server at the same time, spawn a, spawn a process in their, their session and compromise the domain, right? Easy, simple solution. So of course, Microsoft fixed this by not fixing the com session moniker craziness. They just fixed the individual class that I, I reported to them. So I did, six months later, send them a new one. Say, hey, still not fixed. You can do it with this other class. And they still didn't fix it. Anyway. <laughs> okay, so that's sort of my use for, of tooling for analysis purposes, right? Like the ability to simplify and look for areas of interest in, in my research topics. But another thing I find tooling really useful for is if I'm writing that tool to, say, exercise an API or interact with a, a particular area of, of my chosen domain, which, of course, is ten, tends to be Windows, it can act as a mechanism to make me remember how things work. Like, I'd like to believe I have a good memory, but if anyone's ever spoken to me, my ability to remember people's names is pretty pretty limited. And the same is with random esoterica in Windows, I can probably recall quite a lot of crazy stuff in Windows, but there's always limits to my, my ability to remember things. Um, so tooling is a very good aid memoir. Um, and to give an example of, of where I use this, literally sort of like three weeks ago, is 
uh, I was trying to dump all the symbolic links on a, on a Windows file system. I wanted like, okay, I need to see if there's anything, any interesting symbolic links on this drive, on this volume. Show me them all. And I, and I previously researched that, hey, I, I can do this. There's, a, there's an API call which basically says, get me all the sim links or in Windows terms, reparse points. Um, and I'd written this into a tool. I'd written like a function to call query reparse points, which would dump all your reparse points. Awesome. However, every time I tried to use it, I would just get an error. And not even like a, a nice sp specific error of like, this is the reason you're an idiot. No, it was an invalid parameter was passed to the service or, or function. Well, thank you, Windows. That's very generous of you for uh, really helping me define why, I, why I'm messing up. Um, fortunately, future, future James had written <laughs> a nice comment in his, in his code, which basically says, oh, yeah, yeah, if you're, if you're doing this, you need to open this very specific magic file name. And if you don't open this magic file name, you will not be able to enumerate this um, repass point database. So of course I plugged that into my, my script and now magically it started working. And this of course is a, is a comment in this case, but sometimes say an API call can be quite complicated to call. Like it might have a, a weird behavior, like the way you allocate the structure you pass in might have to be very specifically done. Like, so writing code which exercises those APIs can also help you remember how to call certain esoteric and obscure functions in, in code bases. So the sort of final main thing I find tooling really useful for is disseminating information. So again, as I said, like things like calling, how to call a particular API, the best way to sort of disseminate that if, is, is not reading Microsoft documentation, because you generally find it's not, not fantastic, um, is to share implementations of that. And this, of course, works for everything. Like, yes, okay, it seems a bit ironic that I'm telling you to write your own tooling, and now I'm telling you actually share it so other people don't have to write their own tooling. I, I, I understand that. But one of the end goals of your writing tooling is not just to necessarily keep it to yourself, is to share, with, share it with the world and, and hope that everyone benefits from your, your insight and, your, and the time you spent writing it. So pretty much all my tooling I write at Project Zero ends up in GitHub. Um, this this is the tooling which um, I showed the, the snippet of code from uh, a couple of slides back. Um, you could even potentially track my current research topic by seeing what I'm committing to this project at any one time. Um, sort of a side channel attack against my research. Um, now... I, I do find that that sharing tooling is is a net benefit, and most of my tooling is just is analysis tooling, as as the name suggests. This is analysis tools. Um, unfortunately, some AV companies generally get a, the different idea about my tooling, and I can't stop uh, an a, um, I can't stop malicious users necessarily taking my code and re repurposing it because while my tools are not malicious. Inherently, they can be repurposed because they're just a generic library or a generic set of tooling. And even sometimes you get the dreaded hacker tool marking in an AV, like PS Exec is a hacker tool, even though it's clearly not, right? Um, so yeah, currently, if the compiled version of that source code, that analysis tooling, uh, triggers uh, 43 out of 65 uh, AVs on virus total, and they're all like, if you can, if you can just about see the text, it's like. Generic, generic KD, some random generic detections, right? It's not detecting anything specific. It's not saying I'm malicious. It's just like, eh, it looks kind of malicious. Like, we've seen it maybe one person using it maliciously somewhere, and therefore, it must be immediately malicious, right? And this, of course, frustrates me no end, because it means that I can, can't easily use my tooling anymore, because on a default system with Defender, I install my tools from, from the PowerShell gallery, say into PowerShell, and it won't let me install it because it says, no, there's a virus in this because Defender said it's a virus. I even had uh, libraries removed from NuGet, which is Microsoft's package manager for libraries when you're developing. And they just removed it because it said, well, no, Defender says your, your binaries are, are malicious. And they were detecting a, a file which contains 50 lines of code and it's not a single malicious line of code in that. But, but Defender says it's malicious and you're trying to, at that point you're 
hitting a brick wall in terms of trying to get people to fix it. Um, obviously, with the sponsor of Kaspersky here, like my best anecdote for Kaspersky is for a while, people could not read my uh, blog post. Uh, my my personal blog, which tended to have snippets of using this tooling because it would detect the snippets of my PowerShell code in the HTML going to the internet cache and would delete the internet cache before you could actually read the web page. Um, so Kaspersky protecting you from the, the real threats in life, right? So I thought I'd just have a very quick set of demos. Like um, I don't have uh, too much time because obviously I need to relinquish uh, to uh, the next speakers. Um, but this is like my 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 com tooling. Of course, it can be just uh, it's all one big user interface. Um, obviously, it has its red its database all stored in on, in memory, and of course, you can do. You can just sort of look for interesting classes. Oh, this looks interesting. Run it, and it will dump like, okay, what interfaces it supports. And you can start playing with that and do do fun stuff uh, with that tooling. And you can also um, interact with it using PowerShell. So um, you can now just say get com class. And of course, you can now use PowerShell for um, doing maybe more complex analysis, you can write scripts to say, okay, does this have this particular interface and also has this particular property? And this is all, of course, the, one of the beauties of .NET is, of course, these are all just reflectable objects, so you can just inspect them, inspect their properties and, and, and manipulate them. Um, this one is is obviously my, uh, my tooling uh, for... Um, interacting with the Windows APIs, and if I can remember how to type. Um, <laughs> yeah, that, I think that actually said, like, it, it, because the file contains a virus. <laughs> <sighs> That's a perfect demonstration. Like, I did not plan that one. <laughs> Needless to say, um, sometimes it works. Um, and another tool which I didn't I didn't really talk about. This one is probably one of my oldest public tools, and I don't know how many people have actually ever seen Canopy. Um, and this is a tool I wrote when I was a, um, less of a security researcher and more of a um, uh, a consultant doing um, work. And I wanted a tool which was kind of burp, but for ne arbitrary network protocols. Um, and so you, you can, in here, um, just set up things like um, TCP, UDP proxies and write scripts to manipulate traffic. It's kind of like there's a few different tooling, but like the whole idea is this, this is very much a, um, a tool to allow you to inspect network protocols and write tooling for those binary protocols without ever having to... Um, with minimizing the amount of coding you have to write. So you don't have to rewrite a new proxy every time you're on site somewhere. As long as you've got a tool like this installed, uh, you can do it all through the GUI. It's a slightly more uh, easier to use than a, um, uh, just writing Python scripts or whatever. Or maybe you prefer just to write Python scripts. And of course, this requires Windows, so no one, no one really is likely to be using that on site, of course. Anyway. Um, so in terms of takeaways or recommendations, um, the key one really is like you can start small because you can always iterate on your on your tooling. You don't have to write that entire copy of IDA Pro in one go because it, it's it's never going to happen. However, you can just start small, and as you're going along in your research process, trying to make your tooling better, it's always a good idea. Now, uh, the second point is I've I've met some. Great coders, and I met some pretty shonky coders in the security community. Um, if you can follow the good development practices, because future self will, will, will be happy about it when you have to come back to the code 10 years later and work out what, what, the, what on earth you were trying to do with that code. Um, so if possible, try and write, write your code. Maybe even put unit tests in. You never know. Crazy, craziest stuff have happened. Um, and... Regardless of the fact that 
AV likes to likes to detect my tooling. I still value. I think I value um, sharing my results with the community because the community can take those results, find stuff that I never even thought about looking for. Like a very good example of that is the tooling I wrote to attack symbolic links on Windows. That was used. That effectively ended up being used. You could almost consider a pressure campaign on Microsoft to do something about symbolic link attacks on Windows because people were just they could take my tool and quickly exploit almost any symbolic link uh, vulnerability on Windows. And it was just super easy. And at the time, they were also making bank because Microsoft were paying bug bounties for this. Like, I've heard rumors that just on symbolic link, uh, sort of file planting attacks alone, Microsoft spent multiple millions of dollars in bug bounties on, on that particular area before they finally went, hang on a minute. <laughs> um, so yeah, like... It, I'm only one person, of course. Like, there's only so much time I can spend researching any particular topic. So, if I can write and share my, the results of, and my tooling, hopefully, people can can pick that up and and take that further and do something with that. So, thanks very much for listening to my to my keynote. Of course, uh, we probably have a, a a few minutes for uh, for questions, or I'll be around for the rest of the day and can always. Uh, uh, answer questions or be- do give a better demonstration of my tooling if, if you so like. So um, thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you very much. As a person that used your tools in the past, they are great. And I want to ask you how often you find yourself looking for tool for other tools that you do not use. And name me, please, two favorite tools. <laughs> um, I, I do try and look for pre-existing tools. So like a couple of tools I probably I quite value, which one of them, like obviously I'm biased on because of I have contributions in it, is uh, why so serial dot net. Uh, using that to build uh, serialization payloads for for dot net exploits, and of course. Things like the sys internals tools are, again, they're, they're, you can argue they're generic, but the number of security vulnerabilities I've found with process monitor alone is, is crazy. Oh, come on. Yeah. Um, and, pro- and any of those, I, what I tend to look for are tooling, that sort of more generic tooling, which allows me to do stuff. But of course, like Rubius, for example, I, I've, I've played a lot with on when I was doing my Kerberos research was, was very useful for, uh, understanding how certain things work so yeah thank you uh, i have a question so um it sounds like a lot of these problems are domain specific mm-hmm. assuming you would have a sane system where you wouldn't need to copy like goo it's all wrong because you have symbols or strings or you already had the tools which for example could do crazy things like enumerate symlinks yeah will you still write your own tools <laughs> If if all the problems in the world were solved, then then I wouldn't need to. But I think or there's like, always. Would you recommend still writing your own? Yeah, tools? I, I I I think so because unless it is cre- somehow that every single niche is, is, I think one of the things I think I probably didn't didn't make clear on that is another benefit of writing tooling is just understanding the behavior of a system. So yes, I can take for example Rubius, which is a tool to manipulate Kerberos on Windows. However, that doesn't necessarily mean you understand Kerberos and how it works. However, writing your, a full Kerberos library, including a KDC to, to implement Kerberos in your own code, gives you a, a far greater understanding. And it's amazing how many bugs have dropped out just from that process of understanding how it, how it actually works. Because you think you implement something and something doesn't go quite right. And you go, why is that not working? And it's because... There's a vulnerability there which you you didn't realize. So, and yes, or if all the if all the use cases have gone away, there would still be advantage just for that benefit of of understanding how something works. That's a very good point. Thank you. Um, hi. hi. When uh, yeah, what I find is when writing tools, it's one thing to uh, write the tools, but another thing to kind of publish them. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you need to maintain the tools, you need to polish them because, you know, document them. 
for yourself, you know, you don't really need to do that so much. Yes, you need to maybe write a read me for your colleagues, yeah. but uh, yeah. So where do you stand on that? You know, how do you decide? <laughs> do I publish this or not? Or do you publish everything? I don't think so. But yeah. I, I, I don't publish everything. Like, there usually has to be a bar to, especially in Google. Like, the, the difficulty of writing things in Google is, of course, you need to go through the open source agreement. They're, they're pretty flexible. But you have to go through the process of, like, does this in, impact on Google's underlying businesses, for example? If I wrote a new search engine, they probably wouldn't like, allow me to publish that on GitHub, right? Um, so you have to go through a relatively trivial, but, but still a quite a high bar. So anything under a certain size is just not worth the time. Um, documentation wise, yes, my tooling should, could do with better documentation and better, better. Always. Always. But I, 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 I am someone who ascribes to the sort of documentation as code theory that as long as it's open source, if you're just writing, if you're releasing binaries to, the world, then yes, I think you, that needs better documentation, better, um, it's like better deployment processes and all that sort of stuff. Whereas if you're releasing open source code, I think the barrier to the bar is a bit lower. I feel. The source code is the documentation essentially. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and there's blog posts and there's informal documentation and there's presenting to people at conferences. I, or there's training courses. You can make a mint out of out of telling people how to use your amazing tool because you refuse to document it in an easy way. <laughs> Thank you. No problems. RTFC, I think. Okay, I think we're done. Thank yeah. you. Um, we're going to have five minutes.